travelers, this is the Baseball Time Machine. Our first journey takes us to the 1950s. A time of economic boom, the Red Scare, Elvis Presley, and the emergence of a young ball player named Sanford Koufax. Sandy made his MLB debut in 1955 with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and eventually became one of the most dominant pitchers the sport of baseball has ever seen. But how did he do it? Why did he retire at age 31? How did he one day become the youngest player to be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame? Let's step into the portal and find out. Sandy's baseball story begins in 1953, when he received a scholarship to the University of Cincinnati. However, it was a basketball scholarship. Koufax's baseball experience was rather limited, and he was fully prepared to pursue a career in architecture. But he and many others soon found out that he had a blazing fastball. As an 18-year-old, his fastball was reaching 90-plus miles per hour. His main struggle was control. He wasn't a pitcher per se at the time, he was a thrower said Dan Gilbert, who played with Koufax at UC when they were freshmen. The raw potential was there, but throwers don't become baseball legends, pitchers do. Despite the lack of control, Sandy was successful in his lone college baseball season. He sported a 3-on-1 record with a 2.81 ERA, striking out 51 in 32 innings. There was immediate hype behind young Sandy and his overpowering fastball. The big leagues caught word of the phenom as a scout from the Brooklyn Dodgers came to UC to watch Koufax pitch. Sandy was still a very fresh talent, but showed enough promise to earn himself a contract. The contract contained a bonus that required him to report straight to the major leagues for the first two years of his MLB career. This made him a bonus baby. For those of you that aren't familiar with the term, let me explain. From 1947 to 1965, Major League Baseball had the bonus rule. The bonus rule's main goal was to prevent other teams from signing players to their minor league systems. If a team signed a player and included a bonus of $4,000, which comes out to about $46,000 today, they would have to keep that player on their 25-man roster for the player's first two seasons. This didn't necessarily benefit young minor leaguers as they didn't get the opportunity to develop their skills on a lower level. Being thrown into the big leagues as, in Sandy's case, a 19-year-old is a tough task, but we know how this story ends. For reference, four other bonus babies found their way into the hall, Al Kaline, Harmon Killaroo, Roberto Clemente, and Catfish Hunter. The arrival of the MLB draft in 1965 put this rule to bed. So due to this controversial rule, Koufax would head straight to Brooklyn and begin his major league career at only 19 years old. He made his MLB debut on June 24, 1955, pitching two scoreless innings of relief. Quote, when he first came up, he couldn't throw a ball inside the batting cage, said Dodger slugger Duke Snyder. Control was definitely still a concern, as he held a 6.0 walks per nine through the 12 appearances he made in his rookie year. His workload would be slightly increased in 1956, as he made 16 appearances. The Dodgers were one of the best teams in baseball, led by guys like Duke Snyder, Gil Hodges, Don Newcomb, Jackie Robinson, and more. The Dodgers didn't have a big need for Koufax just yet. The ball club had won the World Series in 1955 and the NL pennant in 1956. But when Dodgers owner Walter O'Malley decided to move the team across the country from Brooklyn to Los Angeles in 1958, the team struggled. They debuted in LA with a 71-83 record, good enough for a 7th place finish in the National League. With team personnel changing over this time, the Dodgers became more reliant on Koufax, now 22, and a fresh 21-year-old named Don Drysdale. These two would headline LA's starting rotation for years to come. The Dodgers bounced back in a big way in 1959, finishing 88-68, and 68, good for first in the National League and another World Series ring. From here, Sandy Koufax would steadily improve year after year, soon becoming one of the best pitchers the game of baseball has ever seen. 1961 was the year he really came into his own. At spring training, a simple conversation with catcher Norm Sherry changed everything for him. All Sherry suggested was that Koufax ease up on his fastball a bit and focus more on getting the ball into the strike zone. Sandy was a velocity guy who historically struggled with his control. His Achilles heel soon became one of his greatest strengths. The advice was simple but paid dividends. Koufax finished 1961 with the lowest ERA of his career so far, his first all-star selection, and led all of baseball in strikeouts and fit. The Dodgers had another star on their hands. At 25 years old, Koufax was finally living up to the hype, and it would only get better from here. Quote, either he throws the fastest ball I've ever seen, or I'm going blind, said future Hall of Famer Richie Ashburn. In 1962, Koufax missed a month of action with a finger injury, making nine less starts than he did the year prior. However, it was still a big year for him. Sandy led the National League in ERA, all of baseball in whip and FIP, was an all-star for the second straight year, and threw his first career no-hitter. 13 strikeout no-no would be Koufax's first of four, which was a record until a guy named Nolan Ryan came along. At this point, we've entered Sandy Koufax world domination mode. 
though stepping into the batter's box to face Sandy would be in for a rough four years. Some may try to downplay Koufax's success, citing that baseball was in a dead ball era, but there's no denying that he simply outpitched every other top pitcher in that era. Marischal, Perry, Gibson, even his teammate Don Drysdale never had the kind of grasp Sandy Koufax had on the major leagues. 1963 was the first year of the Koufax dynasty. He ruled the rubber, leading MLB in wins, ERA, shutouts, strikeouts, and more. He earned his first pitching triple crown, first Cy Young award, which he won unanimously, and first NL MVP award, receiving 85% of the vote. Sandy threw another no-hitter, the second of his career as well. The near-perfect season was capped off with his second World Series ring, as the Dodgers swept the New York Yankees in the World Series. He played a crucial role in the Fall Classic, winning games 1 and 4 and allowing only 3 runs in 18 innings, earning himself World Series MVP. Future Hall of Famer and 1963 World Series opponent Yogi Berra had high praise for the Southpaw. Quote, I can see how he won 25 games, what I don't understand is how he lost 5. 1964 was a down year for the Dodgers, but not for Koufax. While LA finished 6th in the NL, Sandy went 19 and 5, leading MLB in win percentage, the National League in ERA, and was an all-star for the fourth straight season. However, late in the season, something went wrong. On August 8th, Koufax banged his left elbow on the ground, diving back into second base while on the base pads. He was soon diagnosed with traumatic arthritis, which would alter the remainder of his career. After two more starts, which were still successful, his season was over a month early. Nonetheless, the Koufax dynasty continued. 1965 started grim. The morning following a spring training game, Koufax woke up to a scary sight. Hemorrhaging caused his entire left arm to turn black and blue. Sandy went back to Los Angeles to have team physician Robert Curlin take a look at it. It was well known by now to Sandy that this arthritis wouldn't be easy to play through. Curlin told him that he'd be lucky just to pitch once a week, and he would eventually lose all feeling in his left arm if he kept pitching at the rate he had the past few years. Koufax tried a medicine cabinet of remedies. He would take medication every night, and sometimes even in the middle of outings and always soak his arm in a tub of ice after each game. Despite the constant pain, Sandy had another career year. Another pitcher's triple crown, another Cy Young, and one of his most impressive accomplishments, a perfect game. On September 9, 1965, Koufax became the eighth pitcher ever to throw a perfect game. In the 1-0 victory, he struck out 14. This game was quite an oddity, with the Dodgers only recording one hit themselves. Their lone run came unearned, as LA's only base runner scored on a throwing error from the catcher. It's hard to imagine anyone playing through what Sandy suffered, let alone throw a perfect game. Koufax was truly in a league of his own, even under extreme pain. Quote, trying to hit him was like trying to drink coffee with a fork, said future Hall of Fame slugger Willie Stargell, who hit a career 087 against the left arm of God. He fought through the arthritis, putting himself and the Dodgers right back on top in 1965, winning the World Series over the Minnesota Twins in seven games. Sandy faced controversy in game one as he refused to pitch. The game was set to take place on Yom Kippur and the holiest day of the year in Judaism. Koufax, like Hall of Famer Hank Greenberg in the 1934 World Series, sat out in observance. Many fans were upset at the decision, especially since Don Drysdale, who made the start in Sandy's place, got roughed up, giving up seven runs in two and two-thirds innings. As a result, the Dodgers suffered an 8-2 loss to Minnesota. To make it worse, Koufax and the Dodgers lost game two, as Koufax's solid performance wasn't enough to get the job done. Future Hall of Fame pitcher Jim Cott kept LA's bats quiet, throwing a complete game only allowing one run. Now down 2-0 in the series, the Dodgers stormed back, winning the next three games. In Koufax's next start, Game 5, he showed why he was the most dominant pitcher of the era, throwing a complete game 10K shutout. The Dodgers would drop Game 6, but on three days rest, Koufax would start the decisive Game 7 and put the team on his back. He threw another complete game 10K shutout, only allowing three hits. No Twins reached third base that day. It would be another 47 years before someone struck out 10-plus in a winner-take-all postseason game. Sandy had earned his third World Series ring, his second World Series MVP, and on the grandest stage of them all, asserted his dominance. In 1966, the arthritis continued to take its toll on Koufax's golden left arm, but the main concern to start the year was whether or not Sandy would have a contract. Koufax and fellow Dodger, star pitcher Don Drysdale, agreed to hold out on the Dodgers until they each got paid what they deemed fit. In a time before free agency and arbitration, this was something unseen in Major League Baseball before. Both Koufax and Drysdale failed to show up to spring training and instead signed on to star in Warning Shot, an upcoming film. After four weeks and an ongoing PR battle with the team, Sandy gave Don the green light to negotiate contracts for both of them. 
Koufax wound up with a slightly more lucrative contract than Drysdale, which honestly reflected their performances, and the two rejoined the team in the last week of spring training. Crisis was averted and the defending champs had their aces back. At the start of the regular season, Curlin assured Sandy that his left arm wouldn't be able to handle the stress of another year, and that he needed to retire. Koufax, ever the competitor, kept the warning to himself and continued to pitch every fourth day. Out on that mound, he remained unfazed and had arguably the best year of his career. He set career bests in wins, ERA, and ERA+. He earned his third pitching triple crown, leading Major League Baseball in much more than just wins, ERA, and Ks. He remains only one of three pitchers to win the triple crown three times. As expected, Sandy also won his third Cy Young Award in four seasons. He started a whopping 41 games in 1966, seemingly in spite of his potentially life-altering injury. On the final day of the regular season, Koufax started on two days rest and led his team to a 6-3 victory, clinching the Dodgers another National League pennant. LA faced the Baltimore Orioles in the World Series and were promptly swept in four games, but not without Sandy putting up a fight. He started Game 2, his third start in eight days, giving up only one earned run in six innings. Quote, he might have been hurting, but he was bringing, said Orioles first baseman Boog Powell. There was no shortage of effort from Koufax ever. That remained evident until the bitter end. In what would be the final game of his career, the Dodgers committed six errors, three coming in the fifth inning, leading to three unearned runs on Koufax's ledger. Los Angeles lost 6 0 and would get shut out the following two games, leading to an easy sweep for Baltimore. Just over a month after the end of the season, Sandy Koufax announced his retirement from baseball, citing his arthritis as the reason. It was later found out that Sandy's arthritis was really UCL damage. Unfortunately, Koufax's retirement came 11 years before the Dodgers conducted the first UCL surgery. Oh, what could have been. In his official retirement speech, Sandy made it clear how much the game meant to him. Yeah, I've got a lot of years to live after baseball, and I just, I would like to live them uh, with complete use of uh, my body. I don't regret one minute of the last 12 years, but I think I would regret one year that was too many. So at 31 years old, an age that many would consider an athlete's prime, Sandy Koufax left the game of baseball. Not because he wanted to leave the beautiful game, but out of protection for his health. Taking a look at his career statistics, it's crazy to imagine what they would look like if he got to play another 5-10 to 10 years. Sandy had done everything there is to do in baseball, and half the time. To this day, he's still considered one of the greatest pitchers of all time, and perhaps the best southpaw to ever step foot on a mound. Despite lack of run support throughout his postseason career, there's no denying that he pitched some of his best ball in October. In his first year on the ballot, Sandy was inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. At 36 years and 20 days old, he became the youngest ever inductee, beating out Lou Gehrig by about five months. That same year, the Dodgers retired his number 32, alongside Roy Campanella's 39 and Jackie Robinson's 42. In the end, Sandy Koufax was a generational talent who in the midst of his reign over the baseball world was forced to step away in light of his health. That four year period though, you knew, stepping in that batter's box, that Sandy was inevitable. This has been the Baseball Time Machine. Thanks for traveling.